You know, when you think about organizational culture, and um, and and I kind of defined it, uh, defined it as how we do things around here, wherever it is, you know, wherever here is. But uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, founded in our values and beliefs right. uh, that drive that. And, uh, you know, our perception of, uh, you know, probably of, of lay people that aren't in the military, you know, is that the military is very regimented and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's made up of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's an organizational culture th there. Uh, so talk a little bit about how do you, uh, shape that culture, um, uh, keep that culture where you want it so that, it, that your folks uh, thrive and ex excel and, and uh, you all achieve your objectives uh, as a military. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to that because I think one of the things that we should all understand is the United States military, we're a cross-section of the society from which we come from, and that's inside the United States as well as outside the, the United States. Many that actually serve as they're even working for their, their citizenship. I would, I, would, I would say that that actually doesn't create a, a challenge, that diversity uh, coming from many different walks of life. That's the greatest opportunity that, that's reflected in our country, but it's also re reflected in the United States military. And so when you take, a, take a, a moment to just understand all the different values, all the different uh, belief systems that are brought together in one, you quickly realize that you actually have great strength, get great strength in that. Not to, not to say that there aren't the challenges that mm. come along with that. I think a part of leadership is actually to welcome those challenges. It, I, 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 find, I, find no, I have no desire to actually be a part of an organization where we all think exactly alike because as soon as we get into group think, then we actually stop moving forward. But by bringing that diverse population together inside the United States military, while we do provide guidelines for this is the discipline, we do believe that the military is certainly held at, a, at a, a, a higher level of responsibility for not only how we, we act, but you trust us that someday, should we have to go to war, we will, we will go to war and we will do the, we will, we'll do the right things for the, for the nation. For that reason, you should hold us to a, to a, higher, a higher standard. But there will be those challenges that, that, that have come because of the diverse population that we have. And while there are, there are many things that, that we would love to have uh, not happen inside the military, just like society, those are the very things that we have to actually work through to, to make ourselves great. In the end, that's actually what leadership is all about. Not, not that you try to stay away from those or you're looking for that select organization, is that you actually welcome that challenge because of, of that diversity. It actually makes you a much stronger organization. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, at least somebody from my perspective thinks about the training that you all uh, uh, provide. I think about the stories you probably tell, the history you have, uh, all the, the routines and rituals and traditions that uh, make our military what it is today and, and so special. And then a lot of, you know, even when I look at your, you know, your dress and your uniform, you look great. You know, the, the symbolism uh, that it, it, what it stands for. I uh, think about how powerful that is. Uh, but really, in any organization, we all think about those, you know, what are those signs and symbols and routines, rituals right. and traditions that, uh, that communicate what we're about. And uh, so it, it, as a, a leader in the military, uh, uh, how do you use those kinds of things to drive what you want to accomplish with your people? You, you cannot be more proud of the heritage of the United States military. And, and while some might say there have been blips along the way, I still look at those as opportunities to continue to make ourselves better. Maybe like the, maybe like the, the stock market, as long as things continue to, to move, move up, there might be blips every now and then. But I think we go back to, our, to, to George Washington when he, when he led the Continental Army and where we find ourselves today as a nation of steel professionals, starting out with an Army and a Navy and now moving forward with Marine Corps, United States Air Force and our Marine Corps and our Coast Guard. It is those, it's that heritage when we look back on where we've been and where we're going to go in the future. I, I would love to say that we've seen the last of war, but we, we're, we're, we're still in the midst of war. As a matter of fact, our country, since about 1990, we've, we've been deployed in active war, just coming out of the Cold War. Certainly, we're, we're worried about certain adversaries throughout the world. But you rely upon that heritage of those who have sacrificed, served and sacrificed before you, what they've actually done, and you know that there's going to be a generation after you. But you can't, you can't not allow yourself to grow. Organizational change is probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. challenges I think anyone, anyone should face. 
because you quickly realize that uh, the way it's always been, and those are those are words that, that I know most of my folks, uh, most of the people that work for me, they, they typically don't use those words around me. That's the way we've always done it. <laughs> That's right. Those, those aren't necessarily good words, but they may, it may be appropriate, but we've got to do self-reflection. We've got to look at ourselves in organizational, uh, as an organization. And we find, if we find we need to change, because this country's changing, the world is changing, technology is changing, the, the way we flu or operated in World War II is certainly different than how we're operating today. And the force that we're actually building today is the way we're going to be operating in the future. We have to actually be open to that change. And that's not just not with technology. That's actually the, uh, the, the individuals. I love the millennials. They are, they are a phenomenal individual. They are extremely smart. We give them uh, a, lot of, a lot of leeway to do great things. And you'd be very proud of what they do inside the United States military. And it's almost a discredit to them in any way to label them because they're just great. They're great humans, great Americans serving. But I, I can tell you that maybe they were a little bit, maybe they're a little bit different than I was when I when I first came in. But we're more we're more alike than we are we are ever apart. So I think the belief system is still strong. Yeah. Well, you know, as an educator and working with young people today, I, I share the same sentiments, and uh, and I think there is just that common. Uh, human element that uh, you know binds us. Uh, at the same time, there's little differences, and uh, one of the things I think about in the military is that uh, you know you have to have things uh, you know right because people's lives are at That's risk. Right. At the same time, the pace of change is so uh, dramatic in, in today's in, uh, environment. So, how, what have you learned about uh, you know change leadership and? And uh, uh, how does the military deal with the pace of change, but yet at the same time that awesome responsibility to protect us? Well, while I, I'm, I'm, I'm an officer in the United States military, I also have two daughters. Uh, and, and by the way, as, as most would say, there's no better way to, to understand patience <laughs> than to have two daughters. Um, uh, and I, I would tell you that the, the, the biggest thing that we learn is, uh, that we should learn as leaders is actually have patience have understanding, put yourself in, in, in their place and understand who they are. But as you said, we also, we have a discipline that we, that we require in the United States military. We have a standard that I think the American people ask us to, to uphold. And I, and I hope we do that every single day. I realize that, that there, are, there are times that, that everybody, everybody stumbles. But the, the, the patience and understanding of, of great leaders, and, and by the way, in this nation, in our United States military, uh, there, are, there are great leaders. And the number of times that, that they see something that they know it's not right, they, they have two choices. They can go fix it on the spot right then, or they can, they can help lead those that are actually maybe, maybe have a challenge right now. They can help lead them to success. And they will have just created a future, a future leader. I think that's the opportunity for all of us. And, and, and while I, I, I look at this servantship period of, of my life as just one more step inside the military, I love serving. I continue to learn every single day. So for every mistake we make as leaders, we should never, we should never regret those. Those are the things that actually make us stronger. We do try to minimize how big those mistakes <laughs> all are. Right, but. All right. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. So t thinking about servantship and, and all that you've learned in this 30 years and, and continuing uh, your career, uh, I guess now you're in a phase of really focusing on developing others and, uh, and, and developing that next generation uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, followers and uh, leaders and then eventually servants. Um, so. Talk to us a little bit about what you've learned about developing others and, and uh, how, what, uh, what can you share uh, with our audience uh, about how to do that well? Maybe a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I, I tell you it's, it, it gets easier later in life. I, I would tell you that, that, that those that are followers right now soon to be what we might term as leaders, as they continue to move on, I think what they're going to find is if you, if you practice that good leadership, it actually gets easier to be a good mentor later on. Sometimes people don't like to pass, good, uh, pass bad news. But I would tell you, if you don't pass 
good feedback to someone, which might be uh, seen as bad news, then you've just, you've hurt them. You haven't given them that opportunity. Now, there's a good way to do that and there's a bad way to do that. Uh, I, there, there's no, no softer pillow than a clear conscience, I've, I've, I've heard said. And the reality is to not be able to provide that level of understanding to others, to be able to provide good feedback on, on how they're doing or what they should be doing, I, I think you find you're, you're doing them a, a, a disservice. I think there's an opportunity also for us always to, to continue to, to, to look back at how we actually learned throughout, throughout life. And then you turn around and you, you pause a little bit before you do that corrective action right away. So as a mentor, I, I think you won't allow those mistakes. You want those mistakes to happen out there while minimizing some of them. You, you, you want them to learn, learn from those. And again, I, I go back to the earlier statement. If, if we ever stop learning as, as mentors, then, 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 then we probably should move on to that next phase of our, phase of our life. So I, I hope that's not anytime soon. Yeah, well, I think we still have some time left. And, um, you know, as I was kind of thinking about our whole conversation, I, uh, I was thinking about uh, something I read not long ago, and I really do believe this in my heart of hearts through experience, but uh, uh, they were talking about some research where uh, they identified uh, the most admired uh, characteristics or traits of, of high-quality leaders. And uh, they've been doing this research for uh, you know over 30 years, mm -hmm. and year after year, it comes back the same four are, all, are always in the top four. It doesn't matter what country or culture uh, that you're looking at. Uh, people admire honesty, and I heard that in your remarks. They admire competence, and you talked about being really, really good at what you do and focus on that. Uh, they admire. Uh, uh, people who inspire them and, and people are inspired by people who are interested in them and care about them and uh, that their values and beliefs align with their actions and you talked about that and then finally uh, 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 people admire uh, forward looking and forward thinking people and uh, and you, you talk about you know looking forward and always growing and learning and so uh, I think you hit all those on the on the uh, the nail head and uh, uh, appreciate you being with us today and uh, any final parting words that you'd like to share? Well, first of all, again, thanks for the, the opportunity. And, and, and I, I said earlier on, but I will echo, I really do uh, appreciate the opportunity that Western Kentucky University gave to me, that Bowling Green uh, gave to me, that my family, that uh, quite honestly, they all still live in Bowling Green. So of those 18 different houses we've lived in, maybe 14 actual moves, I think we've spent 12 of those Christmases back, uh, you know, every Christmas throughout uh, that 30 years back here in Kentucky, and it's always good to come home. But I also appreciate what the nation has, has uh, done for us, and I consider us to be my family. They've allowed us to, to serve. They, they gave us the opportunity, and I hope we've been good, good stewards of that. What I would maybe leave you with is just, just know that you've got so many men and women and their families that are serving throughout the, throughout the country. And they love what they're, what they're doing. We owe it th to them to provide the very best support that we can to make sure that we're giving them all the tools to fill their toolkit, to make sure that they have what they need. Should we have to go to war, then, then that they're ready to do that. The best way to avoid going to war and certainly any type of conflict is to, to quite honestly be so ready that no one would ever think about challenging our, our great country. And that, that, by the way, would be the best, best money ever, ever spent, uh, a, a large military force that never actually has to fight because every single their day they're being used for deterrence. So with, 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 without hesitation, I say thanks for the great support, not only from Bowling Green, but from a, a great nation. And it's an absolute honor to, to serve now, and I, I hope to continue serving. Yeah. Well, I know it makes me uh, rest uh, easier uh, at night knowing that People like you are, are leading and serving, and uh, just know we appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jim. All right.